the power of the network effect and how many people are actually using it and transacting value uh, and the growing market cap is, is really too powerful to overcome. He says, what I would tell any entrepreneur that thinks they're going to disrupt, you have to be 20 times better, at least. That's why I wanted to work in this space, because I was like, to be a journalist, you get to interview people from all walks of life. You get to learn constantly. You get to travel and just see how other people live and what they think. And I don't know. I just always thought it was an amazing career. So I'm blessed to yes, do this. Yes, that's amazing. But honestly, we have so much in common, because when I was younger, I wanted to go into journalism. Finally, I went into engineering with a bit of... Uh, encouragement from uh, my family, but uh, journalism was always something I loved. So I find it, uh, it now. So now I'm sort of getting on this path. You know, I'm exploring this path. That's why, again, I thank you so much for for accepting. I really feel blessed that uh, that you said yeah. yes to this. So um, it was wonderful, and I know your time is precious. So we could uh, we could wrap up uh, as quickly as as you like. No, I'm, I'm happy to happy to chat. You know, this is the same. This is exactly what I did with all the guests that I got. You know, I just genuinely wanted to talk to them, and I genuinely want to help share the message of Bitcoin and understand why people have conviction and what they think about every, everything that's developing the space. So, I mean, I'm just like, so many of us have the same questions and it's just a matter of who knocks on the door and who opens. So I, I commend you for what you're doing. Thank you. Thank you. I like that analogy of knocking and uh, opening. Wonderful. So thanks for opening. Um, I oh, on the on the what Bitcoin did, it was uh, five months ago that it was played. So you had mentioned that you wanted to interview Jack Maulers and you did. So uh, kudos to you for, for accomplishing yeah. that goal. And also the president of El Salvador, that was done too. Am I wrong? Uh, so I sat down with him for a one-on-one, -on -one, but it was not an official taped interview. It's just, I've been trying to get him to come on my show. And, you know, you could probably imagine, A, he gets bombarded with requests, but also the media has been, in particular lately with Bitcoin's price crashing, they've been extraordinarily on the attack and wanting to do pieces that are a little bit more hit pieces. Um, so I think he just, he just wanted the chance to, to understand where I'm coming from, who I am, what my background is. Uh, so we just, we sat down and I had a chance to get to know him for about an hour and oh, great. hopefully he will agree to an interview. We'll see. Oh, okay. Okay. And he didn't, he didn't want that recorded. He was willing to sit down, but not have it recorded. Okay. That's okay. correct. Yeah. You know, and it's, I'm grateful for the chance. You know, I had never met with or sat with a sitting president before. So the <laughs> fact that he took a meeting uh, because I've been requesting an interview so much, you know, a, a lot of it is just persistence. And no matter what you want to do, whether it's journalism or not, you really have to be persistent and people have to see a human side to you because at the end of the day, there's so much politics today. There's so much division. There's people with agendas, people out to get someone. Uh, and so, you know, you have to work hard to build relationships and to, to let people know what your true intentions are. And, and a lot of that comes down to just being genuine and sharing what you want and how you intend to get it. As Bitcoin was hitting the low 20,000 range in the month of June, uh, the attacks on Twitter, especially against people like Michael Saylor and others, were increasing. How did you navigate those times? Were there a lot of attacks coming towards you? Did you try and avoid social media a little bit and keep your mind out of it? No, I didn't try to avoid it. I mean, this is my first time in a bear market where I've actually worked full time in Bitcoin. So it's obviously a little stressful in the sense that I am on my own now. I've literally left my career, my media career to go off and educate people, talk about Bitcoin and do my podcast full time. So when your income depends solely on one thing and that thing is cra coming crashing down, of course it makes you think, uh-oh, I got to, you know, I'm I'm going to have to buckle up a little bit. Um but but here's the thing, you know, I am just I'm not because I understand Bitcoin so well. And because I'm so passionate about this and because I want to get the word out and it's a really important time now more than ever to do so, I knew that even if there's pain, it's going to be short, short term. And when I left my job, I thought that I wasn't going to be able to monetize this at all for like a year. I was like, okay, I'm going to live on savings. I'm just going to bootstrap this. And I was able to actually get partnerships and opportunities. So, um, you know, it's going to come back. The bull market is going to come back. I'm not worried in the long term. I just, I can feel for, it's stressful. Bear markets are stressful. I feel like everyone is a little bit on edge. I feel like the energy on Bitcoin, Twitter, we don't, you know, we, we don't have a place to, to, to put it where it's really positive. Like, oh yeah, rally, you know, momentum, bull, blah, blah. It's all kind of doom and gloom. And when is it going to go lower? What, what company is going to fail next? What's the next? domino. So I think everybody is a little bit stressed out in general. Uh, and I, and I look forward to when that changes. 
Yeah. I mean, I definitely think that there was excess in every market uh, that we're seeing kind of, you know, uh, drain out of the system. And I do think that ultimately in the long run, that's going to be very, very healthy. Unfortunately, there are some painful lessons learned. Like I know people who have lost a lot of money. I mean, you can see the the creditors on some of these lists. They're super long and some people only had, you know, a dollar or two on those accounts, but some people had millions of dollars that they lost and you got to feel for them. But again, this is a system that's very, it's an ecosystem that's very new, an industry that's growing and it's, it's true capitalism. It, the Fed is not going to come in and rush in and save the day like they would if this was like Ford or General Mo- Motors. There's no backstop. You have to do your homework and make sure you know the risks when you're putting your money on an account that may or may not have the liquidity, the the reserves. You have to be very, very careful. And so I think a lot of people will learn a lot of lessons in this bear market. And in, in the long run, that'll be good. But I really do feel for the people that lost a lot of money. It's, it's really sad. On the what Bitcoin did with uh, Peter, like I said, it was it was um, brilliant the way you guys did it. You also spoke about politics, and I find that I have the same opinion as you, and for that matter, many Bitcoiners. So, is it what's up with this? <laughs> we all seem to have the same sort of mindset, right? Is is would that be an obstacle into getting, let's say, a more type of liberal? viewing people on the Bitcoin train? Do you know any liberal type of people on the Bitcoin train? I do. I think that the tides are are changing and they're going to change more rapidly. It's just there is this tendency, I think, right now, because we are so divided, that as soon as one side comes out for something, the other has to just like stick it to them and go against it. And there is no gray line. <laughs> yeah, there's, exactly. no, there's, no, there's, no, there's no nuance. There's no gray in between. It's just kind of like, if you're on this team, this is what you think. If you're on this team, this is what you think. And yeah. I, I hate that. I really do. It's why I've become so jaded to politics, because I think many of us do live in the gray, right? And and we don't necessarily have very strong opinions one way or the other about some of these topics, but it's like you get lumped in categories based on what, you know, red or blue and, and all that. Um, but I will say that the left really just, what I hope is that more of the politicians like the Senator Warrens, who seem to just be so against it without understanding it, really take the time to allow people to talk to them because so many of their constituents, the people they're fighting for with these good intentions, oh, I want to help the poor people, the middle class, well, then you need to learn about Bitcoin because the Bitcoin is one of the only things that can actually fix some of the problems that are most impacting those communities. So it's like, I I, I want them to understand that Bitcoin is about financial inclusion. It's the opportunity to accumulate wealth. It's allowing the chance for the lower and middle class to have a seat at the table and and be part of something, a system that for so long has left them behind. And so I hope that it moves in the right direction. I do, I do think that it will because Bitcoin naturally, when people learn about it, they get really excited and they see that it is not a bipartisan or political thing. Uh, It's something that can bring us all together, maybe. And I really want America to have the competitive advantage to take the first steps to make sure that we are regulating it in a in a smart way and in a fair way and in a way that gives people access to this powerful tool. So we'll see. It's just I was a reporter for 10 years interviewing politicians from both sides, listening to their stupid campaign mm. speeches. Oh, I promise this. This guy's, <laughs> this guy's the problem, but I'm going to fix it. And then here we are four years later. The problem's even worse. It needs more money to fix. And this guy just got a promotion. Exactly. I mean, that is politics today. It's That's why people are so frustrated and they hate Congress, yet everybody gets reelected every year. It's like, <laughs> well, if everyone is disenchanted with our current political scene, but all these people get reelected, how the heck is that happening? Uh, we need more young people yeah, exactly. in office. My goodness, like 82 years old and you're traveling across the country, uh, across <laughs> the world to Taiwan to talk at a semi. I mean, it's just, it's kind of, it's political theater. And I hope that Bitcoin yeah. fixes that as well. <laughs> oh my gosh. So much theater. I'm I'm in Canada. I don't know. Do you, do you, have you followed any Canadian politics in, in the recent years? Because oh, yeah. we've been like pretty dramatic over here. It's oh, But it's 100%. the same thing. I love the word that you say, jaded. And uh, and theater, and then sometimes I even get. We had one um, Pierre Poliev. He even did an interview with Robert Breedlove, maybe oh, about a year ago. Yeah, and then and he's like a Bitcoiner. So I had like we had some hope and some trust in him. You know, we're like, okay, this guy's gonna get us out. But then sometimes you see on some items or some things he says, he's still a politician, right? So like to get to the top, I think 
I think it's hard to stay a true and pure and you always end up like through this political filter that makes you say things that you wouldn't otherwise say. I, I think I think people should be skeptical of politicians in general, especially in a system where it's so much about short term thinking and we've dissolved into this world of kind of crony capitalism where the government can essentially help choose winners or losers based on the current incentive system. And that's why they might, you know, in the long run, they might be against Bitcoin in the sense that it takes away a lot of their power. And it's nice to have power. And they have a lot of power right now. They increasingly have power because of the pandemic and being able to convince people that they're the better judge of, of action than the average individual. Um, and I don't know. It's, it's going to be interesting. The next 10 years, I think, are going to be so transformative. And the fact that we have Bitcoin and all of it, I just think is amazing. So it's going to be there's going to be some tough times, some exciting times, some scary times, some weird yeah. times. I don't know. It's, it's, I'm I'm here for it. I hope I hope I hope not scarier than what what we just lived because that was like pretty brutal. And then I have some friends. I have a friend that's like a hex fan, and they're like trolling yeah. me. They've been trolling me for a while. They're like, ah, oh, Bitcoin to nine k, you know. So then, like, when you see it going down, you're like, oh my gosh, maybe the guy was right. Anyway, so yeah, scary times ahead. But I love your optimism actually, and I love that you mentioned ten years out because that means you're thinking in decades, which is is really the only way to do it. I think. I see this as like a, a savings account for my future, um, something that I don't want to touch. You know, I, I we have not been a nation that focuses a lot on saving. We basically have turned into a nation that is monetized, financialized, both real estate and the stock market to the point that everyone is trying to accumulate enough to have a house that's super expensive now. The, ho- the cost of housing has gone up so dramatically. That's where I think you can really find the rates of inflation. Um, and then the stock market. Now you have to become a day trader, options trader, just to try to make sure that your your money, uh, you can actually maintain the value or increase the value or beat inflation and the cost of living. It's just crazy. We shouldn't, we don't, it doesn't have to be this way. But unfortunately, we live in a system of easy money, not hard money. And, uh, and we have to educate people because people are going to keep voting in exactly what's causing their problem because they don't understand the underlying system. System, right. So when someone votes in the guy who's like, oh, that's the nice guy. He wants to give out free money. That's he's he's got a good heart. Well, no, where's that money coming from? You, it's like you don't even understand what you're paying for. It. Your children's children are going to pay for it by being poor and homeless on the street because of who you just voted in. And people just don't get it. So there's been some criticism that uh, BTC today is not following the spirit of the white paper that it was initially created as a peer-to-peer transaction method. And since it's not really accomplishing that goal right now, that it's a failure. Do you believe that is true? Or is this story of the store of value and hedge against the governments what's needed before we can accomplish a peer-to-peer transactional system? I think that Bitcoiners understand and appreciate that Luckily, this asset is both. It's something that you can store your wealth in, and also it dramatically revolutionizes payment infrastructure around the globe. No, never before have we had a truly public digital infrastructure with no middleman that takes a cut. So I think it's revolutionary. The fact that you can send value from here to Timbuktu settles almost instantly, especially on second layers with very little fees. I think that's incredible, and I think that's going to change the world. And so I in the future where I see Bitcoin's ultimate destiny is being both a store of value and also a medium of exchange and maybe a unit of account. I mean, we'll see what happens to sort of the the digital dollar or the central bank digital currencies or fiat currencies and how they play into the system because I could see those being used on a transactional level and in, in the sense of like stable coins. But I do agree with people like Michael Saylor who feel that a lot of other currencies uh, especially in emerging nations or smaller countries, will collapse into, let's say, the dollar. More countries will be maybe on the digital dollar. But then who knows, 100 years from now, we could all be just transacting in Bitcoin. Uh, I don't I don't know where it's going in 100 years, but I do think that Bitcoin will be the ultimate store of value and is also a perfect medium of exchange. And if I were to create my own cryptocurrency and limit the supply to 20 million, am I understanding that Bitcoin is still better because of the network effect? what's created to date, the miners and the community behind it? Yeah, it's network effect. So anyone can create a new Bitcoin, the the software protocol, everything's open, open source. But think about creating a new Google, 
right? Or get everyone on a new protocol for email. The power of the network effect and how many people are actually using it and transacting value uh, and the growing market cap is is really too powerful to overcome. So anyone right now can create a new search engine or a new Facebook, but now get the globe on it, <laughs> right? So I would argue that it's all. I would argue that it's already too late. Wow, that's amazing. So we'll end it there, Natalie. I thank you so much. You've been amazing, gracious, graciously accepted. I'm going to host that uh, debate now, BSV BTC. Yeah. So wish me all the best on that, and uh, I can't thank you enough, really. Yeah, you got no B- <laughs> no BSV, only Bitcoin. <laughs> That's great, Natalie. You've been you've been wonderful. I thank you so much, and uh, all the best with your your career, and I'll continue listening and following. Thank you so much. Have a good one.